Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, and welcome to viewers all around the world. We want to thank you for joining our webinar discussion today on one year after the white paper protests, reassessing China's politics and society. I'm Bates Gill, the executive director of the Center for China Analysis at the Asia Society Policy Institute, and I'm coming to you today from the Asia Society's global headquarters in New York City. The Center for China Analysis has as its core mission the work of unraveling China's complexities to deliver independent policy relevant analysis. And we, we do this through what we like to call an inside out approach. That is an emphasis on accessing and utilizing Chinese language sources and networks to help inform our thinking. Uh, our center recently celebrated our first anniversary and we've grown now to have 36 full-time and part-time researchers and staff following such issues as China's economy and technological development, China's domestic politics, China's foreign policy and national security, China's approach to an environmental and climate change policy, and China's domestic society, culture, and public health. So welcome you to come uh, to the Asia Society website, check out the work that we've been doing. Now, uh, turning to today's event, I'm very, very pleased and privileged to be able to moderate our session with an outstanding panel of experts who truly epitomize the inside out approach to understanding China. First, let me introduce them, uh, beginning with uh, Lynette Ong. Uh, Lynette is a senior fellow with the Asia Society Policy Institute Center for China Analysis. Uh, but in addition, of course, to her full-time work as professor of political science at the University of Toronto, jointly appointed to the Monk School of Global Affairs and Public Policies Asian Institute. Lynette uh, is well known internationally for her work focusing on authoritarianism, on so societal contention and development. Uh, next, we have Jude Blanchett. Jude holds the Freeman Chair in China Studies at the Center for Strategic and International Studies, CSIS, in Washington, DC. Uh, he's widely published in the leading policy journals here in the United States and internationally. And his most recent book was China's New Red Guards, The Return of Radicalism and the Rebirth of Mao Zedong. That was published by Oxford University Press just a couple of years ago. And then finally, we're also very pleased to have joining us Huang Yanzhong. Uh, Yan Zhong is a senior fellow for global health at the Council on Foreign Relations, where he directs the Global Health Governance Roundtable series. He's also a professor and director of global health studies at Seton Hall University School of Diplomacy and International Relations. Also, I'm very proud to say a former student of mine at the Hopkins Nanjing Center in China. So we've got a great group here to talk about the issues on this first year anniversary of the white paper protests and the lifting of the zero COVID policy in China. And I want to start with you, uh, Lynette. If you would, please just get your take, uh, look back, reflect upon the past year. I'd love to get your big takeaways as to what the protests meant, um, what has changed, what has not changed since a year ago, uh, and how do those protests, as well as the lifting of the COVID uh, a zero COVID policy, how do they continue to resonate in Chinese society today? Over to you. Sure, thank you so much, Bates. Um, and it's great to be here to, sh to share a virtual stage with Jude Blanchett and Yan Zhonghuang, both of uh, my friends. Um, so let me make three points on this first anniversary of the white paper protest. Um, so in November last, last year, university students in several prestigious universities across major cities in, in China, they raised you know, blank sheets of, of A4 paper in protest against the regime. And the protests were provoked by uh, about 10 Uyghurs who died in the fire in Urumuchi. Just before that, um, the fire engine couldn't reach the, the apartments uh, supposedly due to the COVID locked, lockdown. And before these political protests took place in China, there were already hundreds of anti-COVID lockdown protests ha happening across the countries, 
in second and third tier and fourth tier cities related to economic life, livelihood and, and so on. So people were complaining about income being disrupted by COVID lockdown. So it's important to remember that these white paper protests, they were not isolated incidents. They were built up of you know, a bunch of protests that were going on for about six months or so throughout the countries with support from different income groups. So in particular, in the white paper protests, you know, protesters were shouting slogans like um, Xi Jinping step down and down with the Chinese Communist Party, which you could imagine are pretty unprecedented and pose a direct challenge to the, to the CCP. I would say the most direct challenge to the party in decades, not since June 4th of 1989. And soon after that, Xi Jinping abruptly abandoned the zero COVID policies, which he steadfastly imposed for, for three years. So you can see approximate relations between the two, right? So, you know, it's difficult to say, to say for sure whether the white paper protest had caused the party to, uh, to abandon the zero COVID policies, because elite decision making in China is essentially a, a black box. But we can be fairly certain that, you know, the protests have put a certain degree of pressure on the party to change its, its, its course. Um, but the, the other thing to note is that, you know, the white paper protest did not actually only take place in China. It also happened across uh, uh, other major cities in the world. University students from the Chinese diasporas gathered at their campuses, others at public square and others in front outside of the Chinese embassies across the, the world to support the white paper protesters in, in China. So this time last year, as well as a couple of weeks ago, the first year anniversary of the white paper protest, the protest took place in about a dozen cities across the world and for two years continuously. And for many of these young people who took part in the protest, these are university students in their twenties, right? This was the very first time they've ever taken part in a political protest. And if you look at some of the transcripts that has come out, look at the slogans that the protesters have chanted. They say, you know, um, we don't want COVID protests. We don't want any COVID tests. We want freedom. We want dignity unified with the Uyghurs, the Hong Kongers and the Taiwanese. Now their objectives may not necessarily align, but I think white paper protests is a bit of a political awakening for the younger generation in China as well as what social movement scholars like myself would call, I think, a political opportunity to bring different stripes of anti-CCP elements together. And I think that is pretty remarkable because, you know, since 1989, there has been no single event that would actually resonate with the majority of people in China. There has been crackdown and repression in Xinjiang, in, in Hong Kong, but most of the time, the majority of Han Chinese do not actually resonate with the repression suffered by uh, the fellow citizens. But white paper protests, because of COVID lockdown that everyone went through, that is an issue that could unite people across different income strata, different ethnic groups, and across uh, different geographical regions. So I think most accurately, these are no longer protests because of uh, the process that has happened across region, across different country borders, as well as sustained over a period of time. And until now, over two years, we should more accurately call it a movement. We should be uh, differentiated from a protest uh, because of its size and its uh, sustainability. And uh, I will leave it here for the time being. Well, thanks very much, Lynette. Um, I, I will want to follow up with you and get get some um, further thoughts about this idea of a movement having formed vis-a-vis um, a, a -vis a, a only, quote unquote, a, a protest. Um, that's very, very interesting. And, 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 and get your sense of how that's been sustained and, and how uh, you, you continue to see it resonating. We'll come back to that in a minute. But, you know, the points you're raising are so critical. I mean, the the, um, you know, the sort of unprecedented nature uh, of this in its criticism of the Chinese Communist Party, uh, even of Xi Jinping himself, and that and that you that you note, you know, this was not a small group of disgruntled individuals. You know, this this arose from a common experience 
from the top to the bottom of Chinese society, uh, all uh, in one way or another felt the effects, uh, the ill effects uh, of the lockdowns, and then also even the lifting uh, of those of those of those zero COVID policies. So this begs the question, Jude. Um, a year later, uh, what what is the standing then of of the Chinese Communist Party uh, in China today? And in particular, uh, what about the position and power of Xi Jinping himself? Um, love to get your take on whether you know what we've seen over the last year. Are we seeing a new a new situation? Is there some risk for the party or for Xi? Well, well thanks, Bates, and it's really great to to be here and to join Yanzhong and and Lynette. Um, just. Really appreciated Lynette's opening remarks, uh, and maybe to add to them or at least um, uh, try to to uh, support them a bit is what I find very interesting about this is at least um, there's a common perception amongst many that sort of politics is dead in China. You know, the the party under Xi Jinping controls everything. Uh, civil society has been crushed, et cetera, et cetera, and and of course that's true. To a large extent, but as moments like the, the the white paper protests demonstrate, over and over again, politics very much survives in the sense that um, the Chinese people have their own aspirations for what they consider to be a good life. They within the within you know boundaries strive to put pressure on the government to uh, to uh, voice their concerns and try to get the government to. Uh, focus its policy on the challenges that many Chinese face. Of course, the the reaction to the white paper protests by by the Communist Party also show that politics is constrained, and that the party still has pretty fearsome capabilities to be able to intervene and um, uh, disable protest movements from really building momentum. But I'm struck by how surprising the events of one year ago were. And that if you would have rewind, rewinded maybe two or three weeks before they emerged, you would have thought it was impossible that we were about to see the beginning of a proto nationwide movement that brought together various strata of classes and, and social backgrounds with a focused sense of grievance about uh, policy. And I only raise that to say, I, I continue to feel very unsure about my own analytic judgments on China because you continue to have these zigzags, which I, I don't hear many people predicting in advance, even if after the fact, we all create a theory about, well, yes, it was it was obvious that the party was gonna dismantle the COVID policies because they had to because of variants. No one was making that prediction in advance. Second point, Bates, to your very good question is, uh, you know, the relationship between the party and popular legitimacy is is pretty complex. And I think while we know what the major dials are, I'm not sure we always know what the right um, right settings on those are that that supports the party. And it is an, invariably some mixture of performative legitimacy, historical ideological legitimacy, nationalist legitimacy. We're clearly seeing all of those under some degree of strain right now. Obviously, the economy is... It, it, you know, a decade on in the midst of a prolonged slowing down. Um, uh, obviously, we're seeing rising disgruntlement, as Lynette mentioned, having rare, uh, but still uh, calls for Xi Jinping to step down is is remarkable. Um, and of course, China's geopolitical positioning is becoming, I think, far more complicated. So this gets to the question of where's the party and where's, where's Xi Jinping? My operating assumption is... Uh, uh, first of all, you can be unpopular and continue to run a country for a very long time in an autocratic system. So my bias is to think so long as we're seeing signals emerge that Xi Jinping is control in control of the military, the security services, the propaganda apparatus, that to me is a proxy for his position um, administratively is still secure. Even amidst rising grumbling, anecdotal conversations, I'm sure we're all having with uh, friends and colleagues back in China, I, I just get the sense that there's a lot, th there's a growing uh, feeling of malaise that is setting in as it appears that China is, for the first time in a very long time, somewhat directionless. Um, and that the base assumption I think most Chinese had that all the problems we have in Chinese society aside, 
tomorrow will likely be better today than today, or the opportunities for my kids or even my own, my, you know, my own forward movement in my career um, is, is optimistic. I think that's beginning to change, change a bit, but again, I think Xi Jinping remains firmly ensconced in power in terms of all of the publicly observable Leninist tools that he would need to control to keep, to keep his position. But I'll end on this. And this is another, I, I hope this doesn't sound epistemologically nihilistic, but autocratic systems appear very stable until suddenly they don't. And oftentimes we can only understand what the crack in the foundation was after the foundation begins to crumble. And I think now is a, is a time less for coming to sweeping conclusions, many of which I hear in Washington about, you know, peak China and China's about to go over a cliff and Xi Jinping may launch a diversionary war. To me, this is a time for big ears and big eyes. This is a time for really stopping and watching closely because it's clear there's there's a great amount of churn and activity in China's political, economic, and social environment right now. I don't have a clear sense of what the direction of travel is because there's so many moving parts and spinning plates. But it's clear that a formula that allowed all of us external observers to feel like we had some degree of certainty, or at least we knew the sort of framework for Chinese decision-making and action. To me, at least, I'm no longer comfortable that I know what the framework is. Um, so again, I don't want to just spend the whole panel discussion shrugging my shoulders and saying, I don't know. Um, but in many profound ways, my honest answer to your question, Bates, is I have no idea. <laughs> well, these are exciting times then, I would say, for uh, for all of us uh, to be um, have these challenges in front of us uh, and try to make sense of them. I, I like the idea of uh, you know tuning in our ears and eyes a lot more sharply than we have in the past. And many of our past assumptions have to be deeply questioned. That in itself is a remarkable shift, uh, a change uh, that we that we are all trying to grapple with. Couldn't agree more. And now, Yan Zhong, I wanted to turn it over to you and get a little bit more deeply into some of the, the key elements of all of this. I mean, you're one of the world's leading uh, experts on you know, how the Chinese public health system works, uh, what, it, what it means politically, what it means internationally. And I think it's really important for us as analysts not to lose sight of the fact that the white paper protests, while yes, uh, having uh, polit obvious political repercussions, arose out of a health crisis uh, in China, uh, you know, uh, which was manifested both in the severe lockdowns, which affected nearly everyone in the country, but also by its lifting, uh, with some reports of you know perhaps a million uh, unnecessary deaths following uh, the lifting of those um, th those zero COVID policies. In other words, everybody from the most elite uh, in in the country to uh, the least fortunate. Uh, felt the effects of of these last three years out of a health related problem in the country. So I'd really like to get your thoughts on this. A year later, um, what are still the lingering health related uh, challenges? What what has this whole experience exposed uh, to the Chinese people and to the world uh, about China's health system? And then what then are the social political ramifications of this? Um, in relation to the social contract, right, uh, that the Chinese Communist Party has had with its people. I'd love to get your take on all of those questions, Yanjo. Well, there's a lot to talk about here uh, in terms of the uh, implications for the Chinese healthcare system, you know, and what that means for the Chinese political future. Um, you know, I think uh, Lynette and uh, Jude both have, you know, examined some of those aspects, you know, that uh, uh, if you look at the, that opening, right, the December 2022, it was clearly we know, right, that it was not a step-by-step, -step, you know, planned reopening, right? It was a clear sign that the system had reached its limit, right, this Especially when we talk about you know, highly transmissible right, Omicron variant, you know, even with right, the, you have you know highly mobilizational state, which you know I think probably has the the most extensive reach, right? The, the uh, compared with other countries, still, but right, you cannot right the uh, contain the spread 
of the virus. It's just to show the limit, right, of that uh, uh, system. Uh, I'm not uh, just talking about right, the, the political system, but the, the public health system too, right? The, it uh, spent all this money, right, energy, right, resources by uh, containing the virus. It was initially indeed sort of successful, right? Especially when you talk about first one and a half years, right? That this, uh, they were able to break the domestic transmission chain, you know, that the, uh, uh, start quick economic and social recovery, you know, but that was only before the arrival, the highly transmissible, you know, first Delta variant, then the Omicron variant, you know, the diminishing returns clearly became an issue after, right, the, the fall 2021, right? But the thing is that you have that political system, you know, that the steel Right, they refuse to make any changes. Right, that, that, that despite this clear sign, right, that the social dissatisfaction, you know, the uh, economic slowdown, right. That, that, so there was, you know, show that political system was this lack of responsiveness, right, that, to uh, uh, the, uh, the 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 uh, this coming disaster, right. That the because if they were right, they're able to. Listen to the advice of the experts. I mean, talking about especially by like, the foreign media, right? Uh, foreign experts. They will all say, "Well, this is not going to work, right?" But uh, in a clear way, right, well, what you learn from the Chinese state media uh, and the government leaders that you know this is you know going to work. You know, our system is you know they are better than uh, others, right? The uh, so I think that indeed has you know, a, a clear impact on the legitimacy of the regime. We have already talked about that, uh, the, the protest itself, right? It's this clear indication, right, that this this challenges, right, to the legitimacy of the system. But in the meantime, if you look at the aftermath effect, I think the challenge is also profound, right? The, the you know, the, uh, if you talk about the, the economic slowdown, especially the government reliance on the, uh, the, the delivering of economic growth, right now they could no longer claim, you know, this rapid economic growth as the, like uh, one of the pillars, right, of this uh, political legitimacy. Uh, so you would expect that like, in the future, very likely they have to look to other sources of uh, uh, legitimacy, right? That could be from like populism, you know, the uh, pursuit of common prosperity, you know, especially when we talk about China, you've already sort of falling into this, you know, middle income trap, right? And then the nationalism, right? The, the uh, which is the, we used to consider another pillar of uh, legitimacy, right? That's why we're so concerned about Taiwan, right? The, the uh, and then the, 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 the this issue of uh, uh, this, I think probably Jude has more to say about that. Uh, you know, this return to Mao Zedong, right? That this the use of uh, ideology. Right, maybe also even also the the uh, the ancient Chinese culture as a sort of another right alternative legitimacy source. So I think uh, you know, it's, you know, there's a lot that we can talk about in terms of this profound implications of the A4 revolution. Th thanks a lot, Yan Zhang. I'd love to try to dive into some of these things. I mean, I'm sort of seeing two you know, um, areas for further uh, um, consideration and, and, and hard thinking, uh, the, the eyes and ears uh, uh, that Jude mentioned earlier. One, you know, I think does concern the movement, you know, the, 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 the societal elements uh, and how things have changed there and how it gets manifested going forward. Uh, the other uh, maybe is more an elite politics question. Uh, and that is you know, some of the things you've just mentioned, Jen Jong. I mean, how is this going to affect matters of legitimacy or um, uh, efforts to generate uh, you know, new, new mandates or new forms of legitimacy by the party, both to affect its domestic audience, but I think as well uh, affecting uh, China's reputation internationally. And so maybe we can get into a couple of these issues. And uh, to start with you, Lynette, um, on, on, on that first element, you, know, you, you coined this as a movement and you think it's important for us to think of it in those terms. Um, a year on now, you know, where, where do we look? Where should our eyes and ears be uh, to, to try and make sense of this uh, movement, uh, to understand its momentum, 
to understand uh, you know, how it's being expressed both in China and externally? You know, that's a great, great question. And I agree with my fellow panelists here. You know, these are, these are cracks on the society. I think it's the first sign of, 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 of cracks, of significant cracks. And I like to think about, I like to think about the white paper protest and the sudden reversal of the zero COVID policies as the great, as the great leap forward during Mao's, Mao's years, right? It was the biggest policy mis mistake, but then Mao continued uh, to rule China for another few decades. But, but, but uh, the point is that that was the very first policy mistake then shake the cohesion among, among the elites. People start to question him, even though we couldn't see uh, much signs of it until it became very obvious. This is how I would, I would think about it. But you know, in the absence of election or public opinion poll, how do we actually tell that people are starting to lose faith in the system or the legitimacy of the party is actually eroding? So we can think about it as, you know, Herdman talks about exit voice and loyalty. Voice, you know, the people have taken their um, grievances to the street to make their voices heard in China as, as well as abroad. And there's also increasing sign of people exiting the system. You have Chinese people looking to migrate overseas that has increased since the pandemic. The number of Chinese companies moving their capital to safer havens abroad, such as you know, Singapore being an obvious uh, benefactor. So we have seen you know, both evidence of, uh, of voice and exit. Again, I'm not saying that the regime will collapse any, anytime soon, but there's, I think, evidence to suggest that the party's grip on society is really, I think, not as strong as it was just a couple of years ago uh, before, before the pandemic. And I think much of it is due to Xi Jinping's own doing, his over centralization of power. So when things go wrong, all the blame that would go to him and to the central government. So it used to be the case that there is always a gap between central and local governments. When things go wrong, people would blame it on the local government and then would attribute good things to the, to the central government. But Xi Jinping, I think, has hang on to the zero COVID policy so tightly that he couldn't, he couldn't you know, push the responsibility and then shift it to someone else. You know, so you know, he is actually, uh, he, has he has suffered from the very success of his own policies early on. Lynette, do you have um, maybe a, a, a few, uh, I don't know, either personal experiences or anecdotes or conversations you've been able to have with younger people, Chinese, um, you know, that, that reinforces this, this uh, thesis of yours, that this is a kind of political awakening moment, um, you know, that there's a political opportunity for greater activism. Um, I, I presume this was mostly reflected overseas amongst uh, Chinese student diaspora, uh, but maybe you've also had similar conversations with folks uh, who are in China today. I'd just be interested to you know, hear some further insights on how what you're seeing there among young people particularly. Yeah, I've had conversation with Chinese students abroad among the Chinese dias diaspora, some of them my, my students. I've had conversation with Chinese people in China as, as well as uh, Chinese um, students in elite universities in China. Um, I think the first sign of, you know, uh, of political awakening was uh, the abolition of, uh, of the uh, um, term limit several years ago by Xi Jinping. I think to, to many people, to the intellectuals, uh, that was a sign of, the, of, Xi, of Xi Jinping's obvious attempt to hang on to power for as long as, as possible. And that reinforced by a whole range of other things uh, and the latest by, by, white, by white paper protest, I think is, is, it's a political awakening um, in many sense of the word. And I, and I do not want to exaggerate its implications because it would take, I think, a long time as Jude and Yen Zhong mentioned earlier for that dynamics to play out. 
But uh, to me, you know, that is the first sign of crack of or weakening of the state's grip on society. Hmm. Thanks for that. Um, just to turn it, Jude, over to sort of the more of the elite political level, Yen Zhong noted that, um, you know, if the former social contract has eroded or is no longer um, in place or is, is you know, is, is, is really facing headwinds, then what are you seeing um, in terms of alternatives uh, for the party now uh, to reinforce its legitimacy, not simply through coercion, coercive methods, uh, the security state and propaganda state, uh, but you know other other sort of softer, if that's the right word, sources for party legitimacy, like ideology, like nationalism, like populism. Um, are you following this closely, and 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 is it, and is it working, in your view? If you look at the um, main pillars of Xi Jinping's policy priorities, I think it's clear to me that they they have not given up on this social contract, even if as external analysts, we think that it is uh, eroding. And in the uh, 19th Party Congress in 2017, <clears throat> of course, Xi Jinping, in that report to the Party Congress, indicated that the primary, the principal contradiction um, had changed from essentially, you know, growth production and maximization to the quality of growth. And I think implicit or sorry, explicit in that was a recognition that the expectations of Chinese society were were getting higher. Right. It was no longer just about, you know, producing widgets in a factory. Um, it was just no longer about sort of aggregate growth. It was what's the quality of our our healthcare? What's healthcare accessibility? Uh, quality of water, food safety, uh, uh, you know, environmental safety. Xi Jinping clearly talks a lot about these. He talks about ecological civilization, right? He now talks about uh, the quality, you know, uh, better quality growth. I think the challenge is, and to connect this with some of both Yen Zhong and Lynette's comments, if that is the priority list on paper, the implementation of it is not remotely sufficient to meet the rising expectations that that exist. And in fact, as Lynette was just saying, I think the, the structure of the political system under Xi Jinping is creating so many pathologies in the system that it, even if Xi Jinping was really focused on this agenda, um, I, I think it's it's incredibly hard to implement because of all of the bureaucratic challenges that we see, both in terms of m morale in the system, uh, local government finances, which are a train wreck, which means just functionally, it's not a it's not a technocratic or so it's not an in the weeds issue. It means can you pay local government officials? Um, you know, are, and if you can't, which is increasingly the case that local governments are struggling to basically make payroll. Um, then you're going to have massive morale issues in the system. And as Xi Jinping knows, the sky is high, the emperor is far away. Um, his ability to to sort of drive and push through a policy agenda is limited if you don't have an, a full apparatus that is that is on board. So, so to try to answer your question, Bates, I think Beijing still feels like it is on the path to maintaining that social contract, as evidenced by the priorities you see in the in the Party Congress reports in the 14th Five Year Plan, et cetera, et cetera. But they're not delivering it. Um, the political system under Xi Jinping is creating pathologies. And then final thought is, I think the geopolitical environment is inevitably going to create a tractor beam pull of nationalism um, that, you know, I think the Chinese leadership will find it helpful to really frame this as, as Xi Jinping said in March at the NPC, the West, the United States and its allies are encircling, containing and suppressing China um, you know, comrades, this is a hostile world. You know, the West is out to get us. It's time to batten down the hatches, dig in our heels. It's an us against them. I think they're still trying to balance that with a, you know, with a social agenda. But I think as we move on, I would expect to see that much more full-throated nationalist articulation to, to become much more evident. I'd like to get back to that, uh, Jude, and, and uh, everyone can prepare in the back of their minds, because I do want to ask the question about what uh, do the white paper movement and the lifting of zero COVID a year ago 
uh, now mean for China's international reputation and how it's going to attempt to navigate uh, its international relationships going forward. But before that, um, I, you know, Jude has sparked in my mind a question I want to have for you, Yan Zhong, because I think our viewership is not going to be as familiar, probably as 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 you certainly, but and 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 some of us about the healthcare system in China. I mean, what explains this problem? I mean, China is a high middle income country. Uh, it's on the verge of potentially becoming a you know lower high income country. That's certainly their aim. Um, technological miracles, um, fantastic cities, uh, remarkable infrastructure, all the rest. But their healthcare system is awful. Um, why is that? What what explains this? And what are going to what are some of the challenges for? Uh, this system going forward to meet the kind of needs that Xi Jinping says uh, the, the, the party should be trying to meet in terms of people's expectations. Health health is number one in the minds of everyone. Um, and yet that expectation falls far, far short of what's of what would be what would be hoped for. And, and why is that? That's a, a great question. I think, you know, we, we, when you talk about <clears throat> the health care, public health issues, the you know, basically, we're talking about two types of issues, right? The first is ability, right, to uh, cope with a potential disease outbreak, right? That, uh, you know, we thought, that, you know, that, that they fixed that problem, you know, after at least, you know, like uh, significantly improved by the healthcare system's capability to uh, address a potential disease outbreak like SARS, you know, that uh, after 2022, 2002, 2003, Right, there's much change, right, in terms of fixing that the system, but uh, you know, we, you know, we were apparently all you know, overly optimistic you know, about its capabilities. You know that, that before the COVID nineteen hit, right, the Wuhan clearly showed right the lack of the, the morale, right, the uh, the fragile fragility of the healthcare system in dealing with you know a major disease outbreak, especially when talking about dealing with a novel pathogen, you know like uh, SARS CoV two, right, the, the lack of transparency, right, the, the ineffectiveness uh, in action continue to be a problem in the system, you know, and, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a, a little bit concerned that the now when the acute stage of the pandemic is over, there's a lack of adequate discussion, right, on the political aspect of the problem. We talk about lack of transparency. We talk about uh, the uh, 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 lack of uh, in a local state capacity, this problem continue to be there. In fact, uh, you know, the government has, you know, is, is actually considering revising the infectious disease law. But if you look at the, the revision draft, you know, much of the problem, you know, continue to uh, uh, be a concern because even though the focus is on the disease surveillance you know, response capacity, but uh, you know they are, uh, for example, they reward they would reward the whistleblowers, but they still say, well, you cannot publicize information, right? Uh, officially, you uh, through social media, you have to go through a, a government sanctioned uh, uh, channels, right? They have your local government continue to have the authority. Uh, to decide how to respond to the outbreak without the prior authorization from the up-level governments. Right? They have to be still the only official source, uh, official organization to issue any right, uh, the uh, uh, um, uh, disease-related information. So many of the problems continue to be there. Right. So, you know, that, uh, you know, sort of raises the concerns whether, you know, if another disease outbreak hit China now, you know, how they're going to respond, right? Whether the pattern will be the same. In fact, you know, the WHO's recent, you know, the, this request to China asking for clarification of this, you know, the uh, undiagnosed cluster, you know, the, the pediatric uh, uh, respiratory disease outbreak in China is also by sign this is sort of a lack of confidence, right? The, uh, in the transparency, right, in this system. And the second type of system is talk about the healthcare system, right? The, uh, the uh, ability, right, uh, to sort of provide adequate healthcare to 1.4 billion people, right? 
Uh, I just saw the uh, uh, the other day where the government uh, issued data on the people who are covered by the healthcare insurance schemes. Now, even though that like, uh, they still claim ninety five percent of the population are covered, but uh, there's something that uh, I found alarming in that uh, they now saw a drop of seventeen million people <laughs> from uh, the uh, system. You know that um, uh, uh, the government explained this basically as the you know this the uh, elimination the redundancy of people being covered by you know different kind of schemes, but uh, you know many people uh, the healthcare experts would agree that it has to do more with the rising premium that people, especially the rural people, find it difficult to, to pay. Right, uh, I guess the again the la- the local fiscal revenue base being undermined by the weak economy. And the governments continue to provide subsidies to the system, but the subsidies, you know, that if you talk about the, the people out of the pocket payment, right, continue to increase, mm-hmm. and the high the healthcare costs continue to increase, right? The, the uh, 2021, they didn't provide data of 2022, but 2021, the uh, inpatient healthcare costs increased by 6.3%. So, you know, all this, I think, uh, you know, again, you know, that the sort of undermine that social uh, contract, right, uh, in China, right, uh, that uh, we saw the protests already, right, the Wuhan and Dalian, right, those retired workers, you know, protesting against the government efforts to curtail right, the benefits associated with the system, right? So this is interesting. So uh, you've got the p- pathologies, to use a medical term, uh, of the system politically, uh, undermining its ability to be effective, coupled with, as you say, uh, continued sort of b- just basic pragmatic and technological difficulties in, in extending care to such an enormous population, uh, especially to those who are not as well off and cannot really afford uh, to to pay into the system in order to receive that care. Um, I want to do one more round of, of, of questioning uh, and, and just uh, open up the lens again to sort of the international uh, and we'll we'll wrap up on that. Um, starting with you, Yan Jong, and then over to Jude and, and Lynette have the last word. Um, in your travels around the world now, uh, in your communications with folks who are also, you know, watching what's going on in China, uh, um, what 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 is your takeaway in terms of China's sort of international reputation, if you will, um, as a result of of what we saw a year ago, uh, and and how and how things have been handled since. Um, Yan Zhong, do you, do you think it's had an overall negative impact or neutral, or uh, is China still being successful sort of at, at building its brand internationally? Well, I think well, that's a great question. In fact, if you look at the pure survey, right, the clearly, right, we saw the international reputation, right, the, uh, uh, suffered right, because of the uh, 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 the, 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 uh, the Chinese response, you know, to the pandemic, including, right, the, the A4 revolution. Because initially, right, the, they were talking about the superiority of the political system, right, using its, you know, effect to respond to the pandemic as, the, you know, the, uh, to sort of, uh, uh, example, you know, the, uh, 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 to showcase the superiority of the system. But, uh, you know, they, this, you know, after this F4 revolution, right, the, the complete abandonment, uh, abandon uh, of the uh, this zero COVID approach, you know, and then embrace approach the previously mocked, right, the, the laughed at, you know, that uh, completely, right, was, you know, like uh, uh, sort of unravel the whole myth about this authoritarian superiority. And you know? so that is a big hit, right? This uh, the real setback for the the soft power, right? Uh, uh, and in the meantime, right, the, if you talk about right this vaccine diplomacy, right, mask diplomacy, again, right, that was in part this, you know, China tried to use this, you know, sort of initial you know comparative success by right, responding to the pandemic to Project is soft power, right? To you know, provide the you know, so-called global public goods, by right, to improve its international reputation. That did help, right? Initially, right? We saw what well, there's data, right? The poll data suggested, right? That there's improvement of the Chinese international image. But again, right? That the, the we the, the uh, um, 
this you know clear diminishing returns problem of the zero COVID policy with the lack of effectiveness of the Chinese vaccines. I mean, uh, uh, dealing with the uh, Omicron variant, you know that. Uh, the popularity, right, of the Chinese vaccine, also, right, that the uh, we saw the uh, actual significant drop. Actually, that began in the fall of 2021, uh, but essentially after January, you know, the uh, uh, 2022, you know, the global delivery of the Chinese vaccine dropped it to the lowest level because it's, you know. Uh, uh, you know, even like the develop uh, the lower middle income countries no longer welcome the Chinese vaccines. You know, so uh, the uh, there was a clear by right, the setback by right, in Chinese efforts to project a soft power. You know, uh, uh, that uh, you know, the, in terms of its domestic response model and in terms of the uh, sort of eventual failure of the vaccine diplomacy. But that being said, I did see so the variation. Right, the, the, you know, developed countries. I think you know that the international image clearly suffered. Right, uh, you know, look at the, the uh, this percentage of people who held n- uh, negative opinions on China reached to the by unprecedented level, more than two thirds. Right, they held uh, negative uh, attitudes toward China. You know that, uh, uh, but uh, you know, if you look at the, many of the, the developing countries, I think uh, you know that uh, uh, I. Th- you know, we don't have systematic data to show that, but my impression is that, uh, you know, China still, right, uh, I think, uh, um, has, uh, uh, um, in terms of soft power, you know, in terms of the international reputation, uh, I think, uh, you know, that uh, has not uh, suffered uh, 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 much in that part of the world, mm-hmm. you know, the uh yeah, I think we have, we should have some strong expectations that China will be doubling down in its investments diplomatically, financially, and otherwise in the, let's call it the global south going forward. But I'm still interested to get your take on this, Jude. Um, a year on now, uh, following the protests and the, and the sort of debacle of their lockdown and, and its reversals, any, any reputational risk for China uh, globally on, on these issues? Sorry, sorry. Um, uh, just getting used to using these platforms like like Zoom, Bates. Um, yeah, I, I would say this is a question that defies easy categorization. If you're sitting in Washington, D.C., you can convince yourself that China's global reputation has collapsed. Um, if you're sitting in Indonesia, it's a, a vastly more complicated picture. And I think, you know, you feel the, the uh, economic pull of China when you're in Southeast Asia or Africa or Latin America, even if, as Yan Zhong mentioned, clearly at the margin, China's reputation has deteriorated over the last year. I think we just should be careful about, um, and I, by we, I mean us in Washington, D.C., by overestimating uh, the, the decline. China is and will remain a, a vastly influential country on the international scene. Its Its economy is slowing. But it's it's slowing on a massive base. Belt and Road Initiative is shrinking, but remains an important strategic um, uh, toolkit for for China to use. Xi Jinping was just in uh, is in Vietnam, where they signed a strategic comprehensive partnership. You know, so countries are still looking um, uh, to uh, improve their relationships with China. We just had the EU China summit, of course, a few days ago. So folks are still going to Beijing. Xi Jinping is still is still traveling. Uh, but this is a different story. This is no longer one of the world looking at this country at a you know near vertical ascent, um, one that can provide you you know vast market access and riches. Um, that story is gone, and I think we're in a new, much more complicated, uh, more complicated story of still a powerful country, but one that. And I'll end on this. I think the veneer of infallibility has been punctured. That was really always one of the strengths of the Communist Party is this perception that, you know, these people know how to run a country. They know how to run an economy. You know, no matter the challenge they face, they can find another rabbit in the hat. I think those days are over and we're beginning to see China come down to a normal, you know, gravity is starting to pull it down from you know, the celestial heavens and down into the world where I think people look at this as a country with, 
uh, opportunities, but increasingly a political system with vast, vast shortcomings. Thanks. Thanks for that, Jude. Um, great points. And uh, turn it over to you, Lynette, to uh, sum up um, any thoughts in relation to China's international reputation or other reflections then uh, on this conversation and, and what you're following on these issues in relation to China going forward. Sure. So on um, the implication on China's international image, I think Yen Zhong and June have mentioned most of the point that I want to talk about. I think the record is very mixed. Uh, at best, mixed and declining at worst. Very mixed. Um, some initial su uh, success with his mask and vaccine diplomacy at the beginning. But then there was also pushback because of quality issue and, and alternatives. And I think the record could be divided between, you know, the reception in democracies such as Canada, United States and Australia and among the developing countries. Um, I think in the developing countries, um, their reception of, of China and, and China's soft power, they may have, you know, um, more traction than that is reflected in the Pew survey, which is conducted in uh, democracies. And at least in democracies, we have seen an increase in anti-Asian sentiment, uh, which is which many have attributed to the information control at the beginning of Wuhan outbreak. So you know the, the whole um, Asian dias diaspora have also suffered because of the uh, information control by the Chinese Communist uh, regime. I think uh, um, among the developing countries, the Belt and Road Initiative has also changed the way that it is trying to buy support internationally. What I could say and what I could see is, I think, you know, China has realized that uh, money no longer buys you love anymore or not as easily anymore, right? Um, apart from using money to buy loyalty and, and support, you have to think about other things that go hand in hand with that. Um, is no longer one of, uh, you know, just throwing money at, at people and hoping that you become more more popular. And we could see that also reflected domestically in terms of social contract between the party state and its people. If we could think about kind of two broad categories of, of strategies that is carrot and stick for a long time since reform and opening in 1979, the party has used carrots in order to buy, to buy support, economic prosperity, uh, economic development in its various forms. And then more recently since Hu Jintao is about income redistribution, paying uh, increased rhetoric or at least lip service to people who have lost, lost out from, from Gaiga Kaifang, from reform and opening. But all those things that carrots could buy you, uh, the benefits are also depleting. Right. I think the party has, has realized that. So if carrots cannot reach uh, as far as, as before, it's only logical that the party is actually uh, handing out more sticks. And that is indeed what is happening over the last decade or so with increased repression on civil society, crackdown in Hong Kong, Xinjiang, and throughout China, and even COVID, with uh, with the health 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 code, with the help of uh, digital technology, so that is reflected abroad. And I think you know um, it's a mixture of carrot and sticks and rhetoric. Carrot, I think, is running its course, and China also doesn't have as much money to spend anymore. So increasingly, we are going to see a mixture of sticks as well as increased use of uh, rhetoric or ideology. Well, thanks very much, Lynette. Uh, all of these issues are so fascinating. Uh, it's gonna make 2024 another wonderful year, I think for all of us trying to dig in and understand better what's going on inside China and what it means for the world. We've had three fantastic experts who uh, make their living doing this and have been so informative and in helping us understand how we should reflect upon this year anniversary of the white paper protests and the lifting of the COVID-19 zero policy. Um, so thanks a lot. I think you've given us an enormous amount of new food for thought, and I think helped us steer our eyes and ears towards issues uh, that we need to be watching all the more carefully uh, in the year 
coming ahead. So it uh, left to me to thank you, Lynette Ong. Thank you, Jude Blanchett. Thank you, Huang Yan Zhong, uh, for your great insights and taking your time. Looking forward to continuing the conversation with you uh, in the months ahead. Thanks again.